Awol. Now let's deal with the plagues. The plagues on ancient Egypt vis-a-vis -vis the Exodus. Let's understand first of all that the plagues were meant to deliver a psychological or a psycho-spiritual message to the Egyptians. And now the similarities of the plagues with um, the vials that we find in the book of Revelation are beyond coincidence. But we see in Revelation that there's also plagues for this end time system. Now, 2012 marks a very interesting um, time frame. We call this a doorway. This is a doorway. But it's different than what most people have been made to believe. They're made to believe a lot of things based on certain pseudo-Mayan and other cultures, so forth and so on. But the clearest indication of what is really happening and about to happen is contained in the Metaf Kedus, otherwise known as the Bible. So in this Vayera, or Vayera, which means an I appear, and that's from the key words that we find in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, and I appeared to Abraham, to Yishak, and to Yaakov by the name of God Almighty, or El Shaddai, but by my name, Jehovah, or Yahweh, Yahweh, Yah, was I not known to them. And that's what begins this uh, Torah portion, reading and feeding from Shemot, which is according to the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible. This is our study reference right here. And this book can be obtained for those who are who are willing. Now, what um, we're going to do right here is now move forward to the the plagues, the plagues. Because we have our uh, chapter, we dealt with chapter six, the partial genealogy. And now when we get to the plagues of Egypt, we need to first of all understand what and why the plagues. And then what were the gods of the Egyptians? There's a lot of confusion about the gods of the Egyptians. And most of this is because of the false paradigm that um, Europeans, scholars, many of them very good scholars, but most of them infected by the plague of white supremacy, of a Eurocentric only way of thinking. And anything outside of that was deemed to be um, unacademic and, and not relevant, and so therefore they suppress much of the truth concerning the matter. Fortunately, nowadays things in some way are starting to change gradually, you understand, but still that overriding um, false paradigm is there. So before we even get into the details of the plagues, let us first of all point out some recommended readings and books for reference, or if ones have the opportunity to study them in more detail, so be it. Um, the first one is um, The Gods of the Egyptians, Volume 1, and this is Volume 2. Now, the ten plagues, the ten plagues, let's touch on this right here, the ten plagues. So that's Wallace Budge. That's Wallace Budge right there. The ten plagues. But before the ten plagues, there was the pre-plague snake. Remember the pre-plague snake? So before the ten plagues, there was a pre-plague, quote, snake, or in the Ebo, the Ebo, the Chinaike, the Chinaike, or the snakey, the Chinaike, right? Now, we've touched on the Chinaike from that perspective. We've touched on it from the Egyptian perspective, but there's a, there's a little bit of overview that we need to, like a refresher, we need to go over concerning the pre-plague snake. Now, we get to chapter 7. Let's touch on chapter 7. So we find that Ha Elohim had placed Aaron in the role of, in the role of Moses' 
prophet or Mo Musa's prophet. So when we get to chapter 7, it says right here, according to King James Version, and the Lord, like said to Musa, see, look, see, see. Once again, that vision, the ability to see, both to see that which is, 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 is physically present, but also to see the, the spiritual reality in order to see it fully. I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So Moses here in Exodus chapter 7, Moses becomes the God Moses. This is very interesting. Which God Moses was he? But it says, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. So he was a God to Pharaoh. Now, this is very important. This is very interesting because the Egyptians according to archaeology and history and what has been said, they had many gods, or some say there was one god, but there were many aspects or attributes to the one god, similar to in many um, religions, whether it's Islam or Islam especially, they have the 99 attributes of God. And in different religions, there are different aspects of God or different attributes of God. And in other so-called pagan or heathenistic religions, a particular aspect of God was the God that the people worshipped. It was almost like today, in today's society, um, where there is, you know, like you go on the internet, you can find some group of folks who might be into what you're into in that sense. So they had their religion, in a sense, was like that too, or their spirituality is similar in the black community as well. We have more churches in black communities, especially in Brooklyn. We have it in Jamaica, you understand, um, the West Indies, and in other places, a lot of churches, this denomination, that denomination, you could, you're a Christian, but you're Pentecostal, or you're Baptist, or you're Methodist, or you're Episcopalian, or you're Catholic, or you're this kind, or that kind, and there's so many denominations. We point that out because that's, that's the context for us to understand where we're at right now in this spiritual Egypt. And looking at that particular Egypt, these, th these have a resonance. You understand what occurred then? True. In truth, there's only one true God. But that one true God has many attributes. And among the, I can't say just less educated, but among those who were superstitiously, according to the Agul, uh, um, in Netanet, they were inclined to, they worshipped different attributes. Different attributes were were important. It's like how people go to different churches, you understand, know, different type of denominations. I like this kind of preacher, you know, like the itching ears, like what the Bible says, that they go to people who say what they want them to say, but not really give them, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, go through the scripture, proper hermeneutics, the cultural, linguistic context, that's too much. They just want to hear something that says, God loves you no matter what you do, and you're all right, just say Jesus. And people say, all, all right. But then if you were to read Jesus' words, there is more conditions and more qualification. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should admit as truth on him should not perish but have eternal life. So there's a condition, there's a condition, but people like this unconditional thing. So in the Egypt that we're speaking of, both the mythological, there's a, there's a mythos, you know, there's a mythological archetype, but also the historical Egypt that we're speaking of at, at the Exodus and during the Exodus, roughly 1500 to 1440. This was the type of religious environment. Now remember, Egypt is a very old civilization. And we like to point this out, that Egypt is very old, that Egypt has had different periods, like many cultures. If you look at modern Ethiopian Christianity, it's, it's different in certain key ways for those who are able to see than the Christianity, per se, of His Majesty's generation or Christianity even in ancient times of an Ethiopia. So... There are different religious movements and, and, and different peoples 
sometimes introduced when we look at Christianity in America, for example. You know, there's many types of, you know, Christianity. So, though it's all re referencing to one God, you understand, or uh, seeking the one God, even among Christians, for example, although they don't get down with other kind of Christians because they don't think that they're really Christians, so we have those sort of divisions. But then when we look at the, the founder, you understand, the founder was dealing with the truth, but then the truth got broken down into different factions and denominations and cults and so forth and so on. This is the same thing that we have here in Egypt. Now, Yahweh is saying to Musa, to Moshe, look, see, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. So now Moses is made in this in this portion of scripture here in Exodus chapter 7, which is part of the 14th sabbatical, our uh, Rastafari sabbatical study on Vayera to Galat for 2012, we're in the next chapter, chapter 7, verse 1, Moses is made a god to Pharaoh. And Aaron, his brother, thy brother, it says, shall be thy prophet. Sometimes we read these things that we really don't just take a moment and meditate upon what the saying right there. It's saying that Moses now, now in your Bibles, some will say, okay, it's little G-O-D. But in the Hebrew, there's no little or capital G-O-D. You understand? Elohim is Elohim. He is an Elohim to Pharaoh. He is not the Elohim of Elohims. You understand? But he is an Elohim to the Elohim of Pharaoh, to Pharaoh and to his Elohim. And now, through the plagues, the ten plagues, we're going to get a demonstration. But before the ten plagues, we get the pre-plague snake. You understand the snake. Now, what was this particular snake? This snake, you understand, Moses, he came before Pharaoh and he carried a rod, which had become a snake or a serpent. And now, the court magicians, Pharaoh's court magicians, or his spiritualists, you understand, their rods also became snakes. So it's like what Moses did. They're like, hey, we could do the same thing. And so it was done. But here's the key difference. Moses, Moses, his snake, you understand, or his rod, rather, ate up their snakes, right? Ate up their snakes. Now, that might seem like a small, a, a small point. But that's because we don't have the clear context. See, if we put it into the ancient Egyptian context and really begin to see things as they are, this even small area of Scripture becomes even more significant. And this is why we study this, is to see that aspect. It says, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak to Pharaoh. So, in other words, Musa would speak to Aaron, and Aaron will be the speaker to Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land, that he send them, that he almost like exiles them out of his land or out of the land of Egypt. Now it goes on to say, but Pharaoh shall not hearken to you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine army and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. So now the exodus did not happen just because Moses let my people go and boom, the people were let go. No, there had to be great judgments. Yahweh says he had to lay his yod, his, his yod, his hand upon Egypt. Now, this is being accomplished through Moses now. Becoming, and it say becoming like a god. It says you shall be a god. Bamarinya, let's see what the what the Amharic says right here. Let's look in the Mets of Kedus. And it say like a god. You understand? But it says le on amlaka dergehalo that I have made you. I will make you be an amlak or make you be an Elohim too. No, it's not the, not the gods that they had as statues or on the wall paintings, but you're going to be a living God. And now your brother, Aaron, he's going to be your speaker, your spokesperson. So it shows a lot 
about ancient religion, you know what I'm saying, and the religious concepts. So when you know when we talk about God and and we say I and I is God and you know and in that scriptural context, it's important to get the the clarity. You understand? Because nothing here says that Moses was the God who made heaven and earth, but he was a God to Pharaoh. And now Pharaoh worshipped gods. You understand? The Pharaoh worshipped gods. So, it says right here that Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. He's not going to hearken to you. And verse 5, it says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, Yah, or Yahweh. When I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from amongst them. And Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh, Yah, Yahweh commanded them, so did they. And Musa was fourscore years old. Now here's what's interesting. We saw a document, I think it was uh, Exodus Decoded. And they say something like... Um, you know, when he was 65 years. I'm like, where did he get this from? 65 years? Like, he went down in this contest against Pharaoh, and they didn't even mention Aaron, but it's important to understand the role that Aaron plays in this, because many of us might have an idea that it was just Moses standing before Pharaoh, but actually Moses was as a god or as god to Pharaoh, and Aaron, his brother, was his spokesperson, was, was the spokesperson or his prophet, as it says right here. So Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore three years old. So Aaron, Haron, was 43 years old when this happened, right? And uh, Musa was um, fourscore, two, four, six, eight, my bad. He was 80 years old, 80 years old. But he said 65 years, and... You know, and it says 65 years, that number right there. But so he was 80 years old, and, Mo, and, and Aaron was 83, was 83, because score, a score is, is 20 years. You've got to get that, that, King James, that King James lingo right there. Let's just confirm and verify this, Bamarinya. Um, it says, yes, Amanya Amet, so nebere Aronim, yes, Amanya Sost Amet. So never, but it was roughly 40 years. The mention of 40 was roughly 40 years, 40 or so years later. Some say it was more than that particular period of time that Moses was in the wilderness and Moses was in the land of Median and Moses had married Jethro's uh, daughter or his Ethiopian wife. Now, here's where God placed Aaron in the role of Moses' prophet to speak to Pharaoh. Now, we notice one thing that they don't like to mention that point that Moses was made a god to Pharaoh. You know, uh, uh, they like to minimize. So some of the so-called Christians and Jews like to minimize that point. Now, God intended to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he might show signs and marvels or his hand upon Egypt. Now, God told how Aaron would cast down his rod, and it would turn into a snake, and Aaron did so before Pharaoh. Now, a lot of folks be saying that Moses did this, but the scripture clearly, it clearly verifies that it wasn't Moses who, who, who did it, but it was Aaron, because it says, And Yahweh spake to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak to you, say, Shew a miracle for you, then... Thou shalt say to Aaron, Take thy rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Now, we said snake up here, but let's clarify. There's a difference between serpent and snake. Let's just put this, let's put serpent here. Serpent here. Now, let's just, just, just clarify what we're picking up on. Now, Moses, right, or we say Mu. Say, which means the head of a fraternal order, Mu Say, right? Moses was a god or an Elohim, right? Now, Aaron, right? Aaron, Aaron was his prophet, was Moses' um, Nebi, right? Was his prophet or his news bearer. Okay, 
Now, Moses was was 80 years old. And notice the ages, bros. He was 80 years old, and his brother was 83, right? So the 80-year-old God, you understand, and the 83-year-old prophet, right? Now, who is the one doing the operation? It is Aaron. It is Aaron, right? It's Aaron who is the one that Yahweh told Musa to tell Aaron to do this, right, and to cast your rod down. But what we've been taught a lot is that it was Moses who went before Pharaoh with his rod in his hand, and he threw it down, and he did this and that. But the Bible tells us, the Torah tells us, that it was Moses as a god to Pharaoh, Aaron as his prophet, who was doing the deed. And, and this is significant. This is very significant. Because just think about it. I, I just thought about it for a moment. I said, wait. I think I just read it somewhere else where it said Moses came before Pharaoh for rod, for rod, which became a snake. But it doesn't point out the doer. So the attention to details is very, very significant and is very, very important. It said the devil's in the details. Maybe we get the devil, the devil's hiding in the details. Because they, they, they're telling us one thing, but here it says, it says something else. Now, the contest with Pharaoh, the second demand and the first miracle. Because you have to remember that um, they had already, I think, gone before. Um, okay, th th this is the first time with Moses. Okay, it says, and Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. And they did as Yahweh had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh. So it's actually Aaron. Notice, not Moses here, but it's Aaron who's casting down, it says, his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants. And it became a serpent. So now, here's what's interesting about this uh, serpent. Now, when we look at this I'm going to put the letter, this is the letter ne. You see right here, ne? There's ne and there's ne. Let's put, we have ne, right? And then we have ne, right? Ne, ne. Or, or yeah, ne, ne, or ne, ne, right? Negusa, negas. In other words, anyway, the ne. This is, this is the letter Nehas, right? Nehas, Nehas. And in the glyphic, this Ne is a serpent. This Ne is a serpent. This is an interesting point right here when we're looking now at the Hebrew and the Ethiopic characters and the symbolic logic that's embedded in the characters. For example, let's just highlight and emphasize this. All right? Highlight and emphasize this for a moment. So we have, so you can see this a little better, this net, right? This net right here. Almost like a bolt. Looks similar to like a bolt of lightning in a sense. So this is a pre-plague let's call it serpent just instead of snake. Commonly it's snake but there's a difference between serpents and snakes. Now, this um, cobra, the cobra or the ure, the ure, the ure, the aure, in other words, the ure, the ure, it's known as the ureus. If you look at ancient Egyptian um, pictures and, and, and hieroglyphs and other art and facts, you see that they had that, that symbol of the snake you understand, which was known as the ure, and it was a symbol of ruling power, because in Ethiopic it was a symbol of ne and ni, ni for negus. You understand? So we have negus. So let's put this right here. We have some say negus, right? But that's poor pronunciation. We have ne gu. Negush. So we have this symbol right here, right? That this is the symbol right here, because that is the symbol of the 
Ure, the Ure, the Ure, the cobra, which in ancient Egypt was a symbol of ruling power. So let's, let's now understand and comprehend this. So we have Moses, the god Moses, and his prophet Aaron going before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men. So he called his wise men, his technocrats. Now let's understand this. The wise men today would be those who are the technocrats, the technology. That's the wisdom, this modern technology we're using. This is part of the, this is the wisdom. That's properly now during the hermeneutic to understand that what then was called wise men today would be those with the technology, you understand, the technology skills or the technology so-called tricks and the sorcerers. So we have both the technical folk and the people who are dealing with the occult. So we have the technical folk and the occult people, the wise people. You know, even in ancient times, the wheel, even creation of the wheel, that was a wonderful feat of technology. The, the sword and from the Bronze Age and brass and bronze to the Iron Age and from iron to steel. So when we are studying world history and even the rise of the Gentiles, the white European Eurocentric powers, a lot of technology or, quote, wisdom. This is what is codified in Prometheus, the, the god Prometheus Prometheus who steals fire from the gods, in the sense he becomes a god by stealing fire. Fire or Aish in the Hebrew, Aish or Isat. That Isat means also divine intelligence in interpretation. So the word fire. So we have these basic words in scripture like serpent and plague and God or Elohim and prophet. But as we study these words, there are cultural and linguistic and even metaphysical interpretation or, or dualities and meaning that also um, give a, a, a deeper or a fuller, that, that, that enlighten and heightens the interpretive ability, you understand, and manifest, manifestability as well, because if, if it's like with modern technology, because they discovered how to make circuit boards smaller they could do more tricks with it. So in the same sense, so understand and understand that the wise men and the sorcerers were like today's technological people and the people who are on the cutting edge of either the occult or the, or the new age. You understand the sorcerers, you know, have occultic power and there's, there's highs and lows, black magic, white magic, rah, rah, right? Now the magicians of Egypt, it says, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner. So this class was known as the magicians of Egypt. They did in like manner with their encampments or enchantments. Now, what is an enchantment? An enchantment, intonation, word, sound, and power. So here we have on a certain level a, an example of a spiritual warfare. There was a spiritual warfare, a direct spiritual warfare. The God Moses with his brother Aaron as the prophet, you understand? With the, with the rod, you understand? The rod turning into a serpent. Now, just imagine, we would say, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. A rod couldn't turn into a snake. You see, we'll say that today. Just like people would have said that, no, you wouldn't have cell phones and, and, and Internet and all this other kind of stuff. People would not have accepted it years ago, you understand, as being true. Yet many of these modern technologies are just shadows of even ancient technology. But be that as it may, we have here in Exodus chapter 7, at verse 11, we want to look at them, Harik, of that, how does that read, Bamarinya? And um, it says, Pharaonim, Tebibana, Metetenyo, Chinna, Terra, Yegimat, Enoquayoch, Baasa, Matacho, in Dihu, Degmo, Adaragu. So it, it, it uses the Tebiban for the wise men, Metetenyoch, you understand, Metetenyoch for the sorcerers. 
you know what I'm saying, or hitters, strikers, a certain type of hitting and striking. Um, and yeah, good them, the Quayoch, you know what I'm saying, or the shamans, the magicians, the shamans, um, in a sense of of Egypt. Now it mentions Asmatat Cho, the Asmat. Now the root of Asmat, and here's what's very interesting, the root of Asmat, right? Get this. The root of Asmat is Sim. Sim, as we say Shim and Sim means name. Like Shemoch and 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 Simoch. Shemot uh, in Hebrew or modern force Hebrew and Simoch in Royal Amharic. So we have Sim and Shem. Now, Asmat means names or naming, a series of names or naming. So their magic or their power, you know what I'm saying, was, was by the use of words and the manipulation of the so-called fields of reality or the imploring of certain other entities, you understand, to do their bidding in this in this present so-called uh, three-dimensional world. Now, this is very interesting because New Testament, the book of Ephesians, which we touched on a little bit earlier, it's a preparation and an acknowledgement of spiritual warfare. That this, see, what we, what we think we're dealing with even right now with um, mystery Babylon and, and, and spiritual Egypt, Sodom and Egypt, we think it's a physical thing coming out of Babylon is a physical thing or we if you get a bunch of money then you'd be able to you still are s stuck in that matrix so many have not recognized at what point do we dislodge from the matrix and we are now restored we return to where we fell from because we've fallen into a system you see we've fallen into this system now Christos or Christ is that gateway you know, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Where well, we are in the world, but not of the world. You understand? So we're able to overcome the world and also help to reach others redemptively if they are willing to come out of Babylon, of this spiritual and mystery Babylon. So this is a couple of points we want to just show the connectivity and the resonance of these themes because these are real world themes. We talk about spiritual warfare. In this present time, there was spiritual warfare of what four or five thousand years ago as well, and the mechanics of it, you understand, are strikingly, are strikingly the same. So when we're watching a New World Order or Illuminati video, and they're talking about how maybe the monarchy or the British, they uh, John D and different occultic ones was contacting certain um angels, quote-unquote, or demonic entities. So the whole reality of angels and demons are real. But some folks are, how can you call it, so inert, so helplessly dependent on the system that these things are above and, you know, they, they are, as the Bible says, um, the devil has, has, has captured them, in a sense, against their own wills. You know, they, they, they have to be woken up. They're like the sleeper. They have to be woken woken up. This is what the gospel and the call and the message is all about within the time that we have before it is too late. Now, here it goes on to state that, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So they also cast down their rod. These tankwayoch, they cast on it and they became serpents too. But here's the key difference. Aaron's, remember it was Aaron's, Aaron's, Haron's, it was his rod that swallowed up the serpents. This is the key. This is the key. This, you see what I'm saying? That now what sort of technology, the spirituality, is Aaron? And his brother God, Musa, working with that their rod ate up the the magicians and the sorcerers and the wise men's tricks. You, know, you see, because at this point the Egyptians had a misunderstanding 
of their own ancient and so-called indigenous religion. It's like when people are into a so-called religion or spirituality. They've been doing it generations after generations. You understand? And, and therefore the knowledge of it, you see what I'm saying? And the true knowledge of it becomes more superstitious. And see, there ones can creep in. Certain ones creep in. And then manipulate through a hierarchy or a priest-type cult are able to manipulate the sheeple into what we might know today as some of the modern mystery Babylon forms of religion. Even like we like to use the Catholics in a sense as one of the main examples. Although there are some so-called quote Catholics who are good people in Christ. You see what I'm saying? But unfortunately the system in which they are in is a mystery system not based on the mystery of God's righteousness, but rather on iniquity. But the Almighty deals with each accordingly. And this is, this is, this is why we say leave all judgment to him. Now, this judgment, this judgment here is interesting because it says, And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not to them as Yahuwah Yah had said. So now, Moses' rod, now Moses has a rod. Don't, don't, don't make no mistake about it. We're just saying that many people talk about Moses casting down his rod, and it's not Moses casting down his rod. It's Aaron who's casting down his rod. So we learn there's a difference between these two rods. Now here's what's very interesting. In ancient Egypt, you know, there were the, the two rods, you know, the two rods of the of the of the Pharaoh, you know, there was the of Osar or Osiris. These two rods. Now each of them had a particular rod. Moses' rod was the rod of power. It was the rod of king, of kingship or divine kingship. Remember, he was both a type of a king. Even Moses ruled as king. People say Saul was the first king. That might be so, but Moses also ruled as king, and it's right here in Torah. It's right here in Torah, but here he's appearing before Pharaoh as God, right? Deuteronomy uh, 33, 4 and 5 touches on the rod of the king, was the rod of Moses and the rod of power. Now, Aaron or Harun's, Harun's rod was the rod of life. And it was the rod of the priest. Now, this is what's very interesting. His rod was what? The rod of life. Now, what's the rod of life? What's the rod of life in Egypt? Isn't it the uh, Ankh? Right? So, was it some sort of rod that was Mo, uh, uh, Aaron's rod, being the rod of life? You understand? That was, that was the Ankh? connected with that prophethood, you understand? And then we have his brother connected with that that godhood, Elohimhood, or that kingship. So we learn here that Moses and Aaron, their respective rods, indicate, you understand, indicate, first of all, a connection with Egypt. There's a clear indication and a connection with Egypt here. It's impossible to understand this in its proper context without having a good clarity on Egypt and the root Ethiopia or the Tobia. Now, as we move forward, we find that that was the, that was the second demand and the first miracle. Now the contest with Pharaoh resumes. There's the third demand. Now, Yahweh said to Musa, Pharaoh's heart, his consciousness, is hardened. It's, it, 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 it's hardened. And we see, even in this prophetic time, this spiritual Pharaoh, speaking about the government, speaking about the system of things, its heart and its, its consciousness is also hardened. They're hardened in their, their ways. He refuseth to let the people go. They refuse 
to let the people go because it's part of their economic system. So the the Israelites also had become in their um, in their poverty, in their subjection, they had become um, necessary to the then Egyptian economic system and the then Egyptian world order. And this is another direct correspondence to who we are and where we're at right now in this 2012 with this spiritual Egypt. So he says in verse 15, Get thee to Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out to the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou make in thine hand. And thou shalt say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews, of the Hebrews, the Lord God of the Hebrews. Pay attention to that. Here, there's a very direct command. He says, Say what I tell you to say. So here we find it's not just the Lord. It's not just the God of the Hebrews, but here now is the Lord God of the Hebrews. This is the description given to Pharaoh. And there's a significance to that. Have sent me to thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. It's like saying, Let these niggas go, that they may go to Africa. It's like a wilderness. In the wilderness, and behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Behold, before this, you didn't want to shema. You didn't want to simma. You don't want to mess much. You don't want to hear this. Hitherto, thus saith Yahweh, in this thou shalt know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will smite the rod that is in thine hand upon the river, which are in, upon the, let's go over this, uh, I will smite the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters, that are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. So we're getting the first of the plagues. So we just touched on the pre-plague serpent, the the Nehas, the Ethiopic Nehas connected with the 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 kingship Negus, symbolizing the Uraeus of ancient Egypt, which was the the the, the ruling power, which was worn on the forehead of Pharaoh's crown. And there was a cobra in a position, upright position, like the ni in the nigus, like the, the ni, you understand, in nigus, in king, that was ready to strike. On the throne, even of King Tut, there's, um, there, there it is uh, a coiled serpent ready to strike. So what we have here is the overcome the cobra symbol to overcome or to transmute or to capture that symbol. Remember, it didn't say that they got their rods back. Think about it. It didn't say they got the it says that it says that their their the magicians, their rods was turned into serpents and Aaron's rod ate up their rods. But it doesn't say that they got their they got their rods of the serpents back. So, so it ate that up. But what is that synonymous of? Because the power now behind the throne of Pharaoh was his his religious his his religious combine his religious institution was.